Welcome back to our lecture videos. In this section 1.4, we are building on the vocabulary that we learned in the previous video um, and applying it to a couple of different exercises and questions that we want to be able to do. Um, by this point in our module one, um, you should have reviewed and made sure that you feel confident with the vocabulary from section 1.3 and hopefully also watched the deeper look video that I talked about um, for the celestial sphere. That would have gone through some of the drawing activities that we're going to be seeing um, and it will be useful to go back to after this video if you still feel like you want some more assistance um, and I'm always happy to help one-on-one -on -one as well. All right, so let's get started. So in our discussion of the celestial sphere model, we are going to be seeing two different views. Both of them are part of this overall model where we're imagining that the stars are kind of all projected onto this sphere that surrounds the Earth and that we're imagining that instead of the Earth turning on its axis, which we know is what is actually happening, since we don't feel like we're moving, we imagine that the stars are um, moving through our sky instead. And it's a very valid way to talk about our true perspective where things rise into view above our horizon and they set out of view um, away from our horizon. So um, let's talk about these two different views. On the left we see the globe view where we can see these different fixed points in space, the north celestial pole projected out into space from Earth's north pole, the south celestial pole, as well as showing our horizon and the um, celestial equator on that left picture is um, a blue circle around us. That's the Earth's equator projected into space. So one thing I want us to recognize is that our um, observer view is really what we can more easily imagine because that is us out in the field looking at what's up in the sky. Um, and that's what we're going to see more often when we're trying to draw what's going on. But sometimes if you're getting stuck or you're not sure what something should look like, taking that broader perspective and trying to think about what's actually happening in the global view might assist you to get out of a sticking point um, or to see things more clearly. All right, so um, we have learned a whole bunch of different terms from section 1.3. Um, and for the observer view, uh, we talked about zenith, the point directly overhead, horizon, that kind of flat hula hoop circle around us in all directions where the sky meets the ground, and the meridian, which is that line that we drew going from perfectly north through zenith to perfectly due south. There are two terms that we do need to add to our understanding. Um, they are terms that we're not going to use as, um, as often um, as the terms zenith and horizon, but that we need to be able to reference when we're talking about where we see things. So the first term is altitude. The definition of altitude in astronomy has nothing to do with climbing mountains. Instead, altitude is the angle height above the horizon that a particular object is. So if we're looking in a particular direction, we are looking um, from the horizon up. Now what I want us to recognize is that the altitude is defined from the horizon, which means zero degrees altitude is telling us that something is on the horizon. That means it's just visible. Um, so at sunrise, the sun is on the horizon. It has an altitude of zero degrees. And then zenith, the point perfectly straight up, if we imagined um, thinking about what perfectly straight up means compared to the flat horizon, that's a 90 degree angle. That's a right angle. So altitude really can only go from zero degrees up to 90 degrees. If we were to imagine a bigger angle, then actually we should be facing a different direction and measuring something between zero and 90 degrees. And then azimuth is a um, fancy way of describing compass direction. Azimuth is a way of being extremely specific in what compass direction we're facing. Due north has zero degrees azimuth, and then as we rotate in a full 360 degrees, we can be talking about the different compass direction that we're facing. Now, that term is really useful in a lot of different contexts, but for introductory astronomy, it's going to be more useful for us to focus on thinking about the compass directions themselves of north, east, south, and west. And a term I've been using a couple of times is due 
and then a compass direction due north or due east, we need to understand what that means. That means we are facing exactly that direction. And so if azimuth helps us understand what, that, what that's trying to describe. If I'm facing due north, I have an, alti uh, an azimuth of zero degrees. If I am facing due east, I have an um, azimuth of 90 degrees. Due south is an azimuth of 180 degrees, not 179, not 181. Um, and then due west is 270 degrees, all the way back around to zero. I don't want us to focus on the degrees for azimuth. We do need it for altitude. Um, but recognize that due north is specific. Northeast is a general direction. East is a general direction. Due east is a specific location, a specific direction to face. Okay, let's carry on. There are also three key ideas that we will be able to use as a foundation to build all of our other understanding off of. So, I'm hoping that when I say each of these three, they're going to make sense and any prior experience you have kind of observing the skies um, will connect with these three points. The North Star, Polaris, is always near the North Celestial Pole. That actually helps us with two different things. What that means is the North Star Polaris, the reason it's useful and important is because we can face due north and we will see it. And it is along the meridian, that line that we've talked about before. So the North Star Polaris is going to be a way for us to orient ourselves either physically when we're outdoors on a um, clear night sky um, or when we're drawing um, in our notes. So, the second point is that the Earth rises, uh, the Sun rises in the east, in the general east direction. One of the things we're going to add to our understanding in the next video, section 1.5, is that the specific time of year tells us exactly where the Sun's going to rise, but it's always going to be generally in the east direction, sometimes northeast, sometimes southeast, and we will talk about the details later on, but it generally rises in the east. And the sun generally sets in the west. So sometimes northwest, sometimes southwest. We'll talk about all those details in a separate video. But if we can connect our understanding that sunrise we face east to see, sunset we faced west to see, that will help us build all of these other motions um, more easily. Because we tend to have some understanding of sunrise and sunset, the fact that they're in different directions, even um, possibly this kind of confident understanding of East and West. But I want to make sure that we are all on the same page before we build off of that. So if you haven't already, write down all three of those points with any additional remarks you want to make, and then um, we'll continue. So pause if you need to, but then we're going to continue on. Okay, so this new term altitude that we've talked about, there is a cool and important fact for us that the altitude of the North Star, the altitude of Polaris, is equal to the observer's latitude. So there are three different pictures shown here. On the left, the North Star, Polaris, which is right next to the North Celestial Pole, is at an altitude of 90 degrees. What would that mean for where we're standing on the Earth? In the middle picture, the um, North Star is along the horizon at an altitude of zero degrees. Where would that mean for where we're standing on the Earth? And then the last one, the altitude of the North Celestial Pole is roughly in between, so 45 degrees maybe, maybe 43 degrees. Um, where would the observer be standing in that situation? Pause if you need some time to think about it or rewind to have me um, kind of explain those statements again. But I want us to feel confident being able to connect the fact that if we have an altitude of 90 degrees, then our latitude has to be 90 degrees. That means the North Pole. If we have an altitude of zero degrees, then we have a latitude of zero degrees, and that defines the Earth's equator. Somewhere along the equator, we don't actually know where on the equator we are in that middle example, but somewhere um, along Earth's equator. And then that Third option at intermediate latitudes where maybe we're around 45 degrees, that would be very consistent with Grand Rapids at a location of 43 degrees north latitude. All right, so out of these three pictures, it may be worth noting that that third one at intermediate latitude best describes our location here in Grand Rapids. All right, so 
With that initial understanding, I want to check in on some of our critical thinking skills that we're going to be start to building. So imagine that you're camping in a field near Lake Michigan. We are going to look due north and we see a star just now that is just barely above the horizon. We want to think about based on the fact that we know um, that the north star is about halfway up um, due north, that we know that the sun rises in the general east direction and that the sun sets in the general west direction, we want to try to think about what it would mean for any other star in this model to be moving around. So pause the video for as long as you need to think about this. All right, so one of the things I want us to recognize is that if we feel confident ruling out some of these options, that's a really useful step in critical thinking. I am not expecting this answer to be obvious, and I'm not expecting this answer to just be something that we find in our notes. That's not critical thinking, that's just finding as something written down. This is a brand new situation, but we're trying to apply our known pieces of knowledge to this new situation. So, if we see a star, and I'm going to imagine that facing the camera, I am facing north. If we see a star just above our horizon, if we know that the north star is above it, we're going to have to have this star be making circles around the, um, the north star. So now we're trying to figure out, okay, what direction is it going to be circling? Because it's not going to go straight up towards the north star, and it's not going to go straight down away from the north star. Some of these pictures that we've been seeing, let's go back a slide real quick, show circle motions. So instead, we want to narrow it down to um, options one and two. It's either going to go left or right in those 15 minutes that we're watching it. So then we've already figured out where the North Star is compared to our example star. We want to think about the fact that if I'm facing north, facing you, the camera north, to my right is east, and we know that the sun rises in the general east direction, and we know that the sun sets in the general west direction. By taking these foundational facts, we can then, and it might take us drawing on our notes um, to work through this, but this is critical thinking at work, we can then figure out that for this star to be able to move so that it rises in the east and it sets in the west and it goes around the north star, it would have to be moving to the right towards the east because it's currently at its lowest point when we're watching it. And it will reach its highest point at the meridian at a different location. But it's not going to go down, it's not going to go up, and it's not going to go backwards towards the west because it just came from there. It's going to be heading towards the east so it can get back higher in the sky again. So option one here. If you struggled, that's okay. This is the start of our kind of practice with the celestial sphere model. But any time this whole semester, any time that you get a question wrong, flag it in your notes. The reason that these questions are here and there's no points attached is so that you can figure out where you're struggling the first time through and you can either come back to these questions or ask about them um, in uh, student support hours or in discussion uh, so that you can feel more confident if this question comes up again on something that is assigned for points. All right. So we have this beautiful picture here. This kind of picture is known as um, a star trails picture. It's part of astrophotography. Um, and the way that we get this picture um, is by setting up a camera on a tripod and then holding the exposure open for a length of time. Um, based on how long these different lines um, are, is probably a picture taken over the course of a couple of hours. So I want you to pause the video, look at the picture as long as you'd like, and feel um, confident coming up with answers to the bullet points here. So pause the video for as long as you need to try to answer these questions. Okay, I hope that you paused because me giving you the answer is never going to help you understand it better. Um, you checking your work against mine, even when making mistakes, helps you learn a lot better. It's actually better to make mistakes and learn from them than to kind of guess the right answer and then never really sit and make sure that you understand why you got it right. All right, so here's the cool thing. Anytime that we have a picture in the Northern Hemisphere, and we were told this is in Hawaii, so that is the Northern Hemisphere. Anytime we have a picture in the Northern Hemisphere, when we see those circles, there's going to be a brightest um, arc that is closest to the very center of all of those points, and that's going to be the North Star Polaris. Polaris is not the brightest star in the sky, it's not even in the top 25, but it is bright enough that it's pretty noticeable even in, um, in the middle of a city. 
So Polaris is that brightest point. Um, I'll bring the mouse over to it. That brightest point right here um, in almost the middle of all of these circles. And this is where we can also remind ourselves that it is not the same thing as the North Celestial Pole, which would be exactly in the center of all of these circles, but it's the star that kind of marks that for us. Now, as soon as we see Polaris, that actually helps us quite a bit. It means that we know what direction we're facing. If we can see um, Polaris, we have to be facing north because it's a little bit offset. We're not facing due north, but we are facing northish, um, northeast um, a little bit. If we wanted to say an azimuth, maybe we would say like 5 to 10 degrees of azimuth, but I don't actually um, like using azimuth that much. It's not helpful. Northeast is way better. Even saying north is excellent and on track. Now, if these star trails had arrowheads, which way would they point? These are just lines. They don't actually help us think about what direction everything faces. But by knowing that we're facing northeast, we realize that east means these things have to go up on this side. So they're pointing up over here. Then they go over, and I would go off the slide, so bear with me. And then they would have to come down um, in the west. So these would be making big counterclockwise rotations. So that helped us with this first picture. If you struggled with any of these, you could rewind and try again, make sure that you feel confident, or we can move on to another picture. So again, please try to pause to take as long as you need to think about these questions and answer them. All right, so by telling you that this is in France, the key piece of information that that tells us is that we're still in the Northern Hemisphere. If we saw circles, we would know where the North Star is. We don't see circles, but I bet we can start to imagine where those circles would have to be um, surrounding. So off to the um, top right corner of this picture, past the picture would be where North Star Polaris would have to be, kind of in the center of the circles that we're seeing only small parts of. So that means that we're not facing north. We can rule that one out entirely. And because it's off to our right where north should be, if we imagine shifting left from north, that takes a little bit of thinking. We might draw it out if it helps. Um, we would be facing west. So this kind of beautiful color that we're seeing is because this is being taken um, shortly after sunset. Um, and we're seeing, we're seeing the, the sun go away and, and take that light with it. Now, um, what direction we're facing is west, and approximate time of day would be shortly after sunset, since we're still seeing the glow of dusk. Um, and if I asked about the arrows, they would be pointing down to be able to set with the stars. The last comment I'll make here is if we look at one of those... Um, arcs on the far right of the image that doesn't seem like it's going to hit the horizon at all, that would be consistent with that very first multiple choice question I asked. We see a star um, when we're facing north and it's going to be heading to the right because it has to get back up around on its circle. The more of this work that we do, the more confident that we're going to feel with all of it. So I hope that, um, that you have been pausing and thinking to give yourself that opportunity to learn, um, because otherwise it's, it's kind of boring just to kind of hear me talk and hear the answers. Um, being engaged is going to be more interesting, and it's going to help you kind of check your understanding as we go. All right, so another multiple choice question for us. If you want to, um, when you pause, you might also draw some kind of diagram, maybe the observer's view and what we're being told about the view. But go ahead and pause, read the question, and then read all the options. Decide for yourself what you think is the best answer. Okay, so here's an important check for us, and I want us to kind of stop, and if we have not yet, put in our notes um, which of these options we picked. We're seeing a star rise, like the sun, but this is just a random star. It is really, really important that we do not select directly overhead because what that would mean is we aren't picturing these things going up at angles and coming down at angles like we have seen in the previous pictures. We are still stuck with this idea that everything that goes up must go directly up. 
that idea of directly overhead is zenith and that is a very small part of this wide amazing giant sky we do not want to get stuck with the idea that everything has to go directly above our heads this star that rises due east and the sun as well will go up at an angle so that they reach high in the southern sky so if, if I'm facing north, they'll go high in the southern sky behind my head. Stuff can happen behind my head. They're going to cross the meridian at the southern um, uh, part of it, and then they'll come back down and set in the west. So the correct answer is three here, high in the southern sky. And I want you to make a big highlighted circle note to yourself if you picked directly overhead that you need to fight this misconception for yourself. I am not gonna be able to change your mind. You will need to change your mind, but I'm happy to work with you in discussion to talk about ways you can kind of draw this out to really feel confident in the answer. All right, let's continue. If you have been feeling kind of stuck, here are some outside resources to help you practice and visualize. Um, the posted PDF slides, um, these should all be clickable links. If you struggle to open up any of them or if any of them stop working, talk with me and I can help find additional resources for you as well. But I really encourage you to, um, to explore as much as you feel you need to. If all of this stuff is making sense and you are a very visual person and you can think about all these three-dimensional motions, that's awesome. Um, but if you feel like you're struggling, this is a kind of very specific skill that not everyone starts with, but it's definitely a skill that we can all build. So I'm here to be able to build that with you. All right, so a couple of wrap-up questions for us um, to make sure that we're feeling comfortable and confident before moving on to new topics. This is an observer view if we are facing north. We show Polaris about halfway up in the sky. Um, so this is kind of this big picture view, broad view, um, maybe beyond what we would actually see with our eyeballs, but the whole like half of the sky um, from, from due west over to due east. So I want you to consider all the different stars, A, B, C, D, and E that are posted here and answer for each of these bullet points, which letters one or more, um, zero or more, I guess, um, would fit that answer. Pause as long as you need to, and then I'm going to go through the answers just kind of quickly um, so that we can move on to the next one. If you don't understand any of the answers, definitely follow up with me. I want to be able to help you um, or kind of talk with a, with a um, peer and see if there's something that you can kind of help teach each other. So pause and think about all of these. Okay. So for the labeled stars that can be found directly overhead, in this diagram, star B would be directly overhead. Um, it would be at our zenith point. Um, what that means is anything along that same dashed um, location of all the different places that will be found over 24 hours, star D will also um, be able to be directly overhead. So B is in Bravo and D is in Delta can be found at zenith. Then the question is, which stars were below the horizon four hours ago? We have to break this down um, into a couple of different steps. So first, we have to think about four hours in the context of a full day. Four hours is going to be a sixth of the day. So we can imagine taking this whole thing and rotating it backwards um, a sixth of a day. So um, going the stars that were above the eastern horizon have to go back below, we're rewinding time, so star E was below the horizon four hours ago. Um, the new question is which stars will be below the horizon in four hours? Star A seems like it is actually probably close enough to the horizon that when we forward time, it goes shoop, down below the um, horizon and a sixth of a turn is still probably going to be enough to put star A below the horizon in the future four hours. And then the last bullet point asks which stars are in the sky for the longest amount of time each 24-hour cycle. Star C is going to be the one that is in the sky for the longest amount of time because it is in the sky for all different parts of its motion, um, from going high in the east to being along the meridian, high in the sky, and then going back below um, Polaris to be due north but low in the sky. 
If you're curious, um, from there, stars B and D would then spend um, the next most time, um, and they would tie. And then A and E would be the stars that spend the least amount of time above the horizon, because a larger portion of their orbit is below. All right, so let's face south now and think about a couple of different things. So again, I'm going to ask you to pause and think about this, and I want you to consider the stars that are labeled A, B, C, D, and E. They're kind of all roughly along the dashed line, where that dashed line is representing the celestial equator. So go ahead and pause the video to think through those different bullet points, and we'll come back and answer them together. All right, so that first bu bullet point I hope is very straightforward. Star C is currently closest to the sun. It's noon, we can't see star C, but it is still there um, out in space in the same direction that we would be looking to see the sun. Now, when we're asking about which star was the first to rise in the last 12 hours, we have to rewind time about half a circle. So um, star E is closest to setting. That means that it appeared first E showed up, and then D, and then C, all along. So E was the first to rise. When we think about which star will be highest in the sky in six hours, that whole um, set of stars has to rotate, and A is going to be the one that stays highest in the sky as E and D go below the horizon, and star C, which looks like it's right near the meridian, is going to be right on the um, cusp of setting in six hours. Now that fourth bullet point is one that a lot of students get wrong, so I want us to stop for a second and check that we have made a prediction so that we can check it. So which star is going to be closest to the sun at sunset on that day? We need to remember that the sun goes through our sky because the earth is rotating. All these stars are going through our sky because the earth is rotating. All of this motion is going to happen roughly in the same way over the course of one single day. So the fact that star C is currently next to the sun means it will also still be next to the sun in six hours around sunset. So star C stays with the sun over the course of that day. But then that last question, where these stars are going to be next month, that one I do not expect that we... Um, felt very confident answering. That is the one that we're going to explore in our next video when we talk about rather than just daily motion, so what's happening every time that the earth rotates, we're going to talk about what happens as we move around the sun changing our perspective of what stars are in the nighttime sky. So all of these stars will have shifted um, and they're actually going to shift so that in a month or so it will actually be star B that is closest to the sun. But again, we're going to explore that in the next video. So I look forward to working with you in that next video, and I'll see you then.